Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Omkar and my colleague Srinidhi, students of PGDM National Insurance Academy, are here to take forward the first panel discussion, theme for which is the evolving leadership paradigm. The focus of today's discussion will be around the evolving role of leaders in today's era characterized by constant change and disruption. The panelists will explore strategies to, to create frontiers of innovation for the future and delve into the essential qualities and skills necessary for developing high impact leaders in the workplaces of tomorrow. I'm delighted to invite our esteemed panelists to join us on the dais. The moderator for the discussion is Mr. Anand Pejawar, whole time director, SBI General Insurance Company. The other experts in the panel are Mr. Jerry Jose, Chief Human Resources, ICICI Lombard, General Insurance Company. Mr. Priyadarshi Bhattacharya, Head Human Resources, Swiss Re, Global Business Solutions, India. Ms. Sudakshana Bhattacharya, President and Chief Human Resources, HDFC Ergo, General Insurance Company. And Mr. Vikramjeet Singh, President and Chief Human Resource Officer, Bajaj Alliance, General Insurance Company. Let's put our hands together as this guest joins. Before the discussion begins, let me take this opportunity to, introdu to introduce these remarkable personalities who have made significant contributions to the field of human resources. Mr. Anand Pejawa is a distinguished insurance professional with over four decades of experience in both life and general insurance industry. He currently serves as the whole time director of SBI General Insurance Company, decorated with several national and international recognitions. He has been awarded with Mumbai Ratna Award by the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra in July 2021. An alumnus of Columbia Business School, Manhattan, New York, he also, hold, he also holds certifications from IIM Kolkata and ISB Hyderabad. Mr. Jerry Jos is a Chief Human Resources at ICIC Lombard General Insurance Company. He has over 26 years of experience in HR leadership roles across companies like Hindustan Unilever Limited and ICIC Lombard. He is a postgraduate in economics from Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, Pune, and a postgraduate in HR from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Mr. Priyadarshi Bhattacharya is the head of human resources at Swiss Re Global Business Solutions, India. Bringing with him over two decades of experience, he has been instrumental in implementing organizational design and fostering a resilient culture within the organizations he has worked with. Apart from exhibiting proficiency in the corporate segment, he has also served as a commissioned officer from 1999 to 2005 in the Indian Army. Ms. Sudakshana Bhattacharya is the chief architect of people and culture practices at HDFC Ergo, with over two decades of experience across hospitality, communications, and insurance in building people-centric ecosystems She's a person certified coach, as well as a member of International Coaching Federation. Apart from this, Ms. Bhattacharya is a co-founder of social interactive platform, Compassion Circle, and has been recognized with the most influential Women Award and Human Resource Leader for 2023 by Economic Times. Mr. Vikramjit Singh is the President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Bajaj Alliance General Insurance Company. With over two decades of experience, he has worked with various organizations of repute like LNT, Vodafone, and Dorsche Bank. An expert in leadership development, succession planning, organizational transformation, talent acquisition, and learning and development, his work has been acknowledged by multiple coveted awards in the Indian subcontinent, APAC level, and globally. Now, I'll request my colleagues to formally welcome all the panelists.
With this brief introduction, I request the moderator, Mr. Anand Pajawar, to kindly commence the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Um, I think, uh, first of all, thanks the NI management and the organizers of this conference who have invited us. And uh, I think for the students, it's a great thing because yesterday when we were having a little chat before the, uh, I realized that uh, from the private sector general insurance, you have three CHROs who control almost 40% of the business market <clears throat> at one seminar. And uh, one person from the reinsurance, who again, I think, commands 35-40% of the business from the reinsurance. So with this, I think uh, my uh, job has become a little difficult because all of them take care of HR, and I don't take care of HR. Okay, um, Very good thing for Chitra and Sushma to have given me this role. Uh, so I had to work more on the questions that we had to ask, but this was very difficult in doing so. But <clears throat> what I realized is that uh, we are going to address the generation of tomorrow as leaders. And probably a few of us, when we started uh, our careers, it would have been at least about 20, 30, 35 years back. At uh, that point of time, there was nothing like uh, generation ABC, which was demarcated for this generation. But now you have generation Y, Z, and all of this stuff. So where we started, and where we have today reached, and where are we going to actually uh, look forward for, as, as this particular HR team says about uh, crafting workforce of the future. Um, very frankly, even I think when we started our careers, or maybe even about 10, 20 years after that, uh, nobody really thought about what kind of workforce it would be for the future. But today, yes, everybody likes to know what is will the work of the future, how it is going to happen, what will be my uh, contribution to the organization, and where I am going to be. Uh, one of the typical questions when we ask for uh, the campus recruitment is, where do you expect yourself to be 10 years from today? And 99% of the time, we expect that I want to be a CEO of a company. Fortunately, all of sitting here have more than 35, 30, 40 years of experience. We are still not CEOs of the company. <laughs> okay, So that's the big uh, uh, paradigm shift that probably I would look at. And uh, as all of us know that human, uh, human resources is one of the most important uh, asset, which is not normally classified in the balance sheet. But this is something which is useful for every organization. The role of the HR would have probably changed over the period of time. Like yesterday when we were discussing, it was or originally known as personnel department. What it used to do at that point of time in organizations changed over a period of time. And today when we look at human resources, people, officers and all, it's a completely different uh, role that probably the CHROs and the department looks at. So I have a wonderful panelist with me. I'll uh, try and see how I can get the best uh, answers to your questions, because we also discussed with your Sushma ma'am and to manage so what would be uh, the things in your mind. So what we will do is we'll ask certain questions to the panelist. And post that, we will keep about five minutes for question answer sessions for me. For you. Will, will, will that be OK? OK. So. Um, where do I start? I'll start from my uh, right, okay? That's the best way of looking at it. So, Jerry, uh, first question I would like to pose to you. With this little introduction which I said about the huge change that we have seen in the uh, insurance field in the, in the last few years, and the kind of accelerated changes that have been happening in this uh, particular thing, um, what do you think is the paradigm shift that has actually happened over a period of time and how has this role of a leader evolved over a thing, especially with reference to people management? Yeah, thank you, Anand, and uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, you know, it's it's always a delight to be in your campus because uh, you know we from Bombay we obviously you know live in very cramped spaces. We don't get to see a lot of nature. This is a great opportunity for us to basically come and connect back to nature 
and get the feeling of what space means. So always delighted to come here. Obviously, uh, you know, the interaction with the students is, is another important, uh, you know, aspect of this particular conference and colleagues who come in to basically speak. Uh, coming back to, uh, you know, what Anand just mentioned, you know, all of you obviously, I believe, follow the news, understand what's happening in the, in the larger operating environment in which insurance is, you know, what are the different contexts which are changing for this industry, whether it, it is about, uh, you know, the regulatory changes which is basically happening, whether it is about the changes in terms of the, the channel partners' expectations or the cust end customers' expectations, the new, their new needs, aspirations, uh, you know, how technology is disrupting this industry, you know, because technology is playing a very important uh, role in terms of enabling or basically accelerating the speed of how uh, businesses are run. It is disrupting the business models within, uh, you know, within this industry. So these are very, very dynamic changes and these have happened over the years and particularly, uh, you know, in the, in the last uh, few years, it has only accelerated. So as, uh, you know, as, as this evolution continues, one of the important things uh, that leaders really look forward to in terms of team management is, is looking at, uh, you know, people, as uh, you know as having certain key qualities or uh, what i would call as abilities in order to manage this this dynamic and changing uh, you know environment in which the sector operates and uh, you know i like to focus on one or two because i'm sure uh, you know my colleagues here obviously have others as well and uh, you know i would also give them an opportunity to also state their uh, you know view in terms of what is really the expectations that is changing from a people management perspective the first important uh, thing is about uh, you know empowerment which is basically talking about in a dynamic environment when you see changes happening on the go you know if you if you stick to rigid rules uh, regulations you know the ways of working it becomes extremely difficult for people to basically get their job done and therefore it's important for leaders especially in this changing context to empower the people uh, in order to basically get their job done uh, so that as soon as they detect the changes on the ground, because the leader is always very, very distant from the realities that are happening on the ground. The most important thing is that people who see the action on the ground are able to take action immediately. They are able to you know, immediately uh, pass on that information centrally. They are able to basically take the necessary action in order to do it. And for that, it's important for that people have the resources to do it. You know, they are equipped with authority, with information, with resources in order to do it. So one of the important things that leaders really look uh, forward to is how do they empower their workforce and their talent so that they are able to give their best at the point of when, when, when changes are occurring on the at the ground level. The second important thing is, is uh, clearly about, uh, you know, um, the adaptability. You know, obviously changes, uh, people can't react to changes if they don't have an agile and adaptable mindset. Yeah, uh, that is extremely important because uh, if you feel that the things are going to remain the same despite the changing operating conditions, it's very difficult to basically keep things moving. So one of the important things that people would really look at their teams is, is obviously, you know, you can build people for skills, but attitude, you know, their own orientation towards change, how they adapt quickly to the changes that are happening is a very, very critical component. So leaders would also expect the teams that they manage to be far more agile in terms of... Uh, you know, re responding to the changes that they see in the, in, in, in the front line, and then basically take those actions. So for me, these two are very critical, you know, adaptability and the ability to basically, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, you are able to, you are empowered to take actions on the ground. These are two important things that leaders really look at, uh, you know, from their teams. I would, I would actually invite all my other colleagues also to state if there are something else, which is, I'm sure there are many, many things that are critical. But these are two. These two are something that I thought work very, very critically. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I think I'll uh, take the question last with you, for a simple reason that uh, I'll allow the insurers to first say, and then you to reinsure them. I'll reinsure. Them. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Sudakshana, can I have your comments on this? Good morning, everyone. Uh, building on what Jerry has already mentioned, I think the interesting thing is that the buying behavior of consumers changing everywhere. And insurance as an industry is no different. The reason I thought I'll start with this is because all of you sitting here are really the consumers of future if you already aren't. 
So whatever we do in the organizations or whatever you will do in the organization when you join is, is where you pick up from where the customers would leave. So I'm, I'm sure most of you or all of you are uh, familiar how a Swiggy or a Zomato works. <coughs> And uh, at every step, it's so transparent that as a consumer, I know exactly where my service is or where my product is. And uh, the interesting thing about insurance industry now is that I think as consumers, people are now asking that if my food comes in so-and-so time, in three clicks, and I'm, ma I'm made, the information is available for me to see where it is, then why should insurance buying journey be any different? And as HR people, if we have to support and reciprocate this consumer behavior, we have to make sure that the organization is agile, like what Jerry already mentioned, um, and it supports the technological advancements. And all of you, when you become the leader for tomorrow in insurance, all of you are going to really design the organization that will support these changing consumer behaviors. So importantly, um, processes, systems, all of that will be a support. That's a larger part of the organization. But as, as leaders, it's important to pers demonstrate personal leadership by understanding and mapping what's really happening in the market. If I were to leave, I mean, why would you listen to me? Just because I've been invited in NIA and I'm sitting here? No, you would listen to me if only there's something that you can take away from here. So the only thing that I would leave in my now with all of you is that invest time to understand whichever industry that you go, what is, what is happening in the industry and how, is it, how are the consumer behaviors changing. That will be a big cue for you to become leaders in any field that you take up in the organization. So I'll pass it on to... Yeah, Vikram, your, your, your thoughts on this. Thank you, Sadikshna. See, a lot I can see is... Some of you obviously listening to it. Some things are heavy and some things are light, and that way, sir, we'll all we are trying to make it a little more practical in the time which is there. So, just to add on to what Jerry Sudikshna both said, so see, in terms of the way it is evolving, and I think so Sudikshna touched upon very, very well. Other than the agility, the part of obviously around saying how the customer behavior is changing, and obviously that's how the employee and the leadership behavior will change. Uh, Another thing which obviously comes out other than those two things is, one, how much purpose-driven you find yourself and equally the leaders in terms of what they are doing. And that purpose can come from obviously the customer behavior and equally from your personal requirements in terms of what you want and how you want to shape your career and therefore how the work is actually helping you to do so. And therefore the second bit which comes along with it in building that leadership is how much ownership everybody takes, whether it's a leader or an employee, when you join in the corporate life cycle. Uh, the ownership, which obviously is not by the pure policy or purely by the level which you will get entrenched into, or otherwise the leader is already. Uh, the ownership is about what you would like to turn around. And once you start turning it around, you build that leadership of obviously whether a domain expertise or expertise in terms of a certain level of deliveries which are required, whichever are assigned to you. Once you do so, leadership automatically starts to build upon. Because leadership itself is a very big word. It's not that uh, there is one type of leader or there is only those big leaders in terms of which are there on the media, in terms of which are available and you guys on the Insta or on the social media will look forward to. Leadership is in terms of anything which you turn around well and better than maybe others or better than yourself, you build on the leadership question in you. And that's how you build upon that. I won't take much of the other time because we don't want to go philosophical into any of the things. Keep it more practical and we would want it to be reinsured with our uh, co-panelist Priyadarshi who represents Swissri and let's see what does he do uh, with that. I think the advantage of going last is I am that guy in the group discussion panel who says I concur with everybody on my table. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> after such, um, you know, learned people have already spoken on the topic. I'm not sure I have too much to add. Uh, so I'll just keep it very short. Um, f I'll give you a little, a sm very small military analogy. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of this guy called General Norman Schwarzkopf, who was the commander of the Allied Forces during the first Gulf War. Okay. Uh, he has a quote, uh, which is quite famous within the military circles at least. It says, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. But if you must be without one, 
be without the strategy. Strategy can be learned. Uh, it can be developed over time. It can be honed over time as you learn more and more about the work that you do. Um, character is very unique to you. Yeah? The second military analogy that I will give you, and this is again from a leadership perspective, I remember a long, long time back, 1998, when I was in the academy, um, we had just cleared the um, SSB exam that we have to go through. I'm not sure if any of you have ever attempted to join the armed forces and anybody gave the SSB exams. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fun experience, right? Once you clear it, you think you've achieved everything in life and you end up in the academy, and then it's an extremely rude shock in every way possible. Um, you question every moment of your decisions that have brought you to that point. However, um, one year later, we get two stars, and we think now we have genuinely achieved everything, right? However, I think I'll always remember this one uh, thing that one of my instructors had told me, that um, when you're a leader, uh, and whenever, and leader can be defined as anybody, you don't need to manage people in order to be a leader. Um, leader can be anyone who is exhibiting or is displaying or is executing tasks which impact the organization at a, at, at a wider level. Um, the analogy that he also gave me was that uh, the day you become a lieutenant and you join the army, you're responsible for the life and death of 35 people. You, however, at, are at a slightly elevated position and the standard tendency that comes along with it is that because you're higher, you can see more. You can see the wider picture and you see the 35 men below you who are waiting for your orders and you think you know more. The reality is that you have two pairs of eyes looking at those 35 men. There are 35 pairs of eyes looking back at you, observing your every move, examining your every decision, and hence, it's also leadership is something that comes with a lot of responsibility attached to it. And I completely agree with, um, uh, you know what Jerry just spoke about. Um, I think the term that I'd use is called learning mindset. Your ability to, so whatever you come with, whatever you learn, it's never going to be constant. You have to constantly evolve yourself um, as a leader and you have to constantly learn. That's the only way that you're going to keep yourself relevant in the times which are constantly changing. And like Mr. Anand mentioned, uh, the question that you would ask, you know, how, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Times are changing so fast that 10 years, I don't think we have any understanding of what's going to happen in the next 10 years. So it's so unpredictable. So hence leadership and the expectations of leadership are for you to have that learning mindset at all times. Great, uh, uh, I think uh, I like that the thing about you when you said that when you get into the uh, academy, you feel you get got lost and then you grow and all that. I think half of the, and excuse me uh, students, when I say half of the students feel the same when they get into an um, organization and suddenly, uh, but today's uh, population, as we say, and when I say today, because we are slightly one generation ahead of you, so we'll have that liberty of saying today's uh, generation and the earlier generation. I'm more impatient. Impatient to get things done, impatient to get to the uh, levels where they are looking at and how it has to be done. Now, from your army uh, uh, background that you have and the kind of uh, thing that you just shared with us, um, what do you think we're coming to on the other side of the HR thing? Um, are leaders born or they made, number one? Uh, why? Because there's some constant debate which keeps on happening of that. And if um, the leaders are born, uh, then what is the role the management institutes play in uh, doing that thing? So can you probably, with your experience and the things on the armed forces side and how you see the whole picture when you come on uh, the other side, uh, throw some light on this. My, and this is a very personal view, I don't think leaders are born. I think leaders are shaped. Um, and it takes a lot of effort to, to shape a leader to, uh, to what you want them to be. And it's a mix again of what, um, what the organization wants you to be or what the management school believes in its own ethos, principles, and those elements that get imbibed into you, it's equally what the individual or who the individual wants to be. So it's a mix of both, uh, and it's a never-ending process. That's why I said that learning mindset is extremely important. So I don't believe that leaders are made. Uh, even coming from an armed forces background, leadership is something which is drilled into us from day one and constantly and constantly, and it never stops. 
it never stops. So just to give you an armed forces context in this, um, you start off from the academy, it's one year of training, but a large portion of it is around how you're expected to be a leader. Um, and just if you think that you become an officer and you join and that's it, it doesn't end there. Uh, in order to become, become from a lieutenant to a captain, there are multiple exams that you need to give and there are large concepts of leadership that are built into that. So it doesn't stop there. If you're going to become a major or a lieutenant colonel, you need to go through uh, higher command. Then you need to go through senior command. So at no point of time um, are, is that, that hammer of constantly hammer and chisel and making you and shaping you into the leader that the armed forces wants you to be ever stop. And it's the same and it should be the same for organizations as well and for business schools as well. That I think it's very important that organizations as per their culture, as per their definition of the kind of behavior and characteristics that they expect leaders to, to, to showcase, that you have your programs, that you have your disciplines and that culture constantly keeps shaping you as you as you move along. It's the same, it's, it's no different from the armed forces to outside in my view. Vikram, what is your uh, view? Uh, what, what do you think uh, the management institutes like NI can help in creating the future leaders uh, which insurance companies would like to have? Sure. Uh, first of all, do you, you, do you agree it's born or made? <laughs> no, thanks for raising that controversy. <laughs> Again, my personal view, it's a hybrid because uh, one, because of the function which we are into, our function will die off if we really think if they are not to be shaped. But equally, the other part of the function when you hire is when you hire people with a certain traits which are inherent in them and therefore they are born with those actually. So it's a hybrid, so you're the function of obviously selecting and the biggest thing in the world when they say, you know the toughest job is to find out the, the right person for the right job whether it is to the head of the countries in that way, uh, and some of the time that power is with the voters, uh, how do they excise that actually? So, so it's a balance of both, uh, which is more important. And the time we understand that balance, um, where do management institutes start to pop in into? Management institutes obviously come in from two perspectives. One, to build in your a little more depth of the particular domain skills which you are wanting to build for yourself and the choice you made for your life and the institutes try to help you hone that better with the kind of artifacts, with the kind of lectures as experiences, with the kind of obviously interactions with the others which is there. Another big part which institutes actually play is to say that you go through the first level of you know, the stress of obviously passing through your continuous exams and attending the lectures and sitting with your backs on those chairs wherever you are in your rooms doing your assignments, which also certifies the fact that you're getting ready for the first level of obviously saying, dealing with obviously the stress which is going to come in for thinking about the subject equally listening to what's going to happen when you start hitting the world. Whether it is your external customers or your internal customers within the organization and some of the times having those open ears and eyes to what you have to do. And therefore the, the institutes play a very big role in terms of shaping up what you will be for tomorrow. Because in the end what will differentiate you is the character which I think so Priyadarshi also picked up and I think so that comes from some of those big leaders saying about it. Character gets built up a lot of times at home, at institute, but the first time most of you would be away from your homes, a lot of you at least, unless otherwise you were in hostel before. They shape up your characters actually in that way. Uh, and therefore that first level of development from the management institutes actually starts to happen and they play a very, very important role in building that values that character, equally the first level of stress of that discipline on that and you will get certified after you clear your course when for the, for us there is a higher probability that you will succeed in a particular job. And that's how decision making is always done in life where you pick up a certain things because the probability of that to suit to your interests is a little higher. If, 
and that's where I think so. I'll take a pause because there are other aspects you touch, but I think so. Others can touch upon in the interest of time. Also. I was wanting to ask a different question to uh, Sudakshana. As an HR uh, professional, uh, what are the challenges maybe uh, you people face uh, on this rapidly uh, regulated industry like insurance? You know, like in industry we see that uh, IRDA, the D comes first. Then nowadays the D is more predominant. Earlier, it, earlier the R was more predominant. So what, what the huge amount of changes that happen? How do you, as a HR professional, see these challenges, and uh, how do you want you know, look at uh, overcoming them? Thank you for asking this question. I see a lot of empathy in you know you bringing that up. So um, with all these changes happening through the regulatory authorities, I think it's giving us tremendous opportunities. So I would first want to reframe challenges to opportunities. Um, the insurance industry today, is, especially general insurance, is at such an exciting stage because it looks like the entire muscle power um, to build an industry is behind this. Um, I kind of, because I started working with telecom and I'm sure Vikram can also relate to it, there was a time when that's what happened to the mobile industry. And if some time back, it happened to the life insurance industry. And I now see the same momentum, opportunities, uh, support. Mm, um, all kinds of policy reforms are happening for GI. So what does it mean for a human resource uh, function, like you said? It means that it needs a complete relook at how employees are serviced. Because today, it's not just about servicing the need, but it's about anticipating and creating those experiences as individuals. I don't think today's workforce, and all of you, you've already you know, started challenging the organizations by making us uncomfortable um, to create a workplace which you will really like, which was not the case when we started working, let me tell you. Nobody, nobody acknowledged our, uh, uh, you know, our generation which is going to enter workforce and preparing the work, workplace for us. But so you guys have already nudged the organizations to start preparing to welcome you. I think that's the biggest opportunity that human resource has, and especially in this industry. This industry is going to grow tremendously. And we are at that, um, that inflection point where it's going to, the trajectory is going to be completely different from what it has been in the last decade for GI. So which means that each, everybody who enters the workforce today, they enter as an individual. So it's not just because a company has standardized great policy, it's going to appeal to everyone. In fact, we changed some of our, um, we tweaked some of our HR practices last year, even philosophy. We said, you know, we will follow that every individual requires a different um, uh, bouquet of services and experience. And I think that's, that's a fundamental change that this industry is calling the HR people to make. That it's no more one size fits all. It's every individual requires a certain experience within the organization, whether it is learning, whether it is progression, whether it is money, whether it is status, whether it is just fulfillment and purpose. Like Vikram mentioned, a lot of people are driven by purpose today. So as an organization, am I being able to offer a bouquet to every individual in the organization who can relate, saying, OK, so I'm, I want to learn for the next couple of years. This organization is giving me the opportunity to do that. While somebody else wants to perhaps is moving into a different life stage and wants commercial support. So I think this is the exciting opportunity that general insurance as an industry has for human resource function. Okay. Jerry, your views on this? What are the challenges probably you feel because of the rapid changing environment uh, on the regulatory side and how you people are coping up with that? <coughs> So just to add on and build on to what uh, Sudakshana said, I think so one important uh, thing which HR professionals are really, uh, I would say it's struggling with and also trying to solve the issue is about how do we organize ourselves for the future of this industry. Uh, because today, obviously, this industry has been there for a very long time. You know, the, you know we work in hierarchies and functional silos. And the kind of demands that the market will have on us is more about how do you become far more agile? How do you work as cross-functional teams? You know, go out in the market and meet the customer's requirements. So it's one big challenge is about how do we organize ourselves, you know? And that's really an issue in terms of how do we put together structures which can actually help meet the customer's needs much faster, which can break down functional barriers, help people to basically adopt ways of working which can help, you know, be far more agile. 
So that's an area where HR is also work, working very closely with the business in order to see how to adapt the ever-changing business model to basically meet the needs of the customers. The other important aspect is culture. You know, like I mentioned, you know, culture, uh, you know, culture and engagement are two important uh, aspects where HR is still struggling to understand how to make employees adapt to these new changes. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can have great systems, processes, you know, all these you can institute policies you can build in place. But to align people to that, to make get the best out of them through these is a is a different task altogether. And therefore, how do you engage these people? How do you basically get their discretionary best so that they can basically contribute to the best of their ability? That becomes a very important thing. Uh, you know, the kind of collective mindset you need in the organization for looking at being far more agile, responsive to the market is very, very different from the way we basically service the market and the customers. So therefore, the cultural transformation is all about first adoption of technology, you know, how can technology be leveraged in a better way to service the customer, understand their needs, and more importantly, basically, you know, have this learning or agile mindset that we discussed in order to basically meet the market's requirements. So in addition to what uh, Sudakshana mentioned, it's also the culture and engagement of the people to basically align them to these new requirements, and also the, the way we are organized in order to basically meet these requirements. Thanks, Vini. Uh, you come from a... Um a reinsurance kind of a thing, which earlier was, uh, I don't know whether I should say that, but it was a non-regulated kind of a thing up to, up to a few years. Just off late, you have been you know, asked to open up registered and regulated and all that. How do you see as a reinsurer in the country and one of the bigger, uh, you know, the bigger players in this market, uh, from the HR angle, do you see any um, challenges that you have on the reinsurance side? Uh, not really, to be to be honest. And I think, uh, to a certain extent, we are getting more regulated, um, and uh, that's just a good thing because it's bring, bringing about more consistency in the way that we operate within the reinsurance industry as well. Um, and it's not that we were not compliant with these basic fundamentals even before we were being asked to comply to it. So I don't think it's necessarily changed that, but. Uh, what we are definitely seeing is that risk management overall as a job family mm. is becoming more prevalent or more in focus in a reinsurance organization like Swiss Re. Okay. So we are seeing more investment in a larger team, more complex capabilities now being brought into the organization. And not just for India, I'm seeing this pretty much across the globe at this point of time. Um, I represent the global service center for Swiss Re uh, headquarter of Bangalore where we service uh, parts of Swiss Re all the way from the Americas to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we also look after the regulatory reporting for these countries. So we are seeing that also get tighter and tighter over the last few years. So I think that is changing. It's also, cha with that change, it's bringing about more investment in those capabilities. So it's more about a, a little bit of a shift in our employee base and who we employ and the kind of work that we do. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity overall, not, not so much of a challenge as I see it. Yeah. Great. Um, Vikram, uh, as Jerry was mentioning about uh, empowerment, uh, you know, accountability, technology and all that, I think one big thing which is today looked at is uh, other than the human intelligence, the artificial intelligence. And uh, whatever human learning was there is now being moved to uh, machine learning and analytics and all those kind of technological developments which have, uh, we are seeing in the uh, thing. Uh, how do you think the uh, technology is impacting the uh, leadership decision in the organizations? Do you, do you, do you see that as a big thing uh, for the students to understand how this is also impacting uh, the large organizations and what, what they need to do from their point of view to get things in a much better manner? And uh, as Dr. Uh, Ranjit said, the bosses could be either a computer dinosaur or something like that, and these guys are completely savvy. So how do you, that, how, how, how do you also build that between the two generations which they uh, have to work with? Sure. Well, that's an extremely good field because I think so with the chat GPT recently, I think so it stuck everybody's mind, took that mind space quite a lot. But having said so, uh, in the organizations, 
the decision making is and for any human the decision making let's if i were to look at it is based on that basic grasp of obviously saying what our mental filters were from what in the past have we seen for each one of us that is getting changed by the perspective of obviously saying the machines have that repository of data which they can go through faster than the humans if it is on a pure logic however on the emotional sides which were never captured earlier even in the systems those still remain and therefore the difference in terms of the roles for humans versus machines where they can do better is a the rule base versus the judgment base a rule base is where you got a particular process particular way of decision making the data is already in the systems and therefore they can help you turn around better decisions faster decisions which includes whether on the customer behavior or includes in terms of the organization preferences in terms of placing their resources and capital into certain things and equally changing however when it comes to emotional and the judgment side which is a new decisions is where the humans are much better and therefore the transition for each one of us is one is to ride the wave of understanding those skills but equally understanding what more than those skills will differentiate you guys in this whole philosophy while you get into the corporate sector while the corporate is equally designing and putting in into all efforts to build that uh, thing however it is not a overnight transition uh, the skills which generative ai is bring in will start to supplement something uh, the part which was played earlier the agility the learning mindset will still continue continue from a perspective of obviously saying that your skills you will have to the the shelf life of a skill will also become lesser what you would have learned even till now maybe just within 2 to 3 years may become totally obsolete the question is after 2 to 3 years that may only take 2 months for a new skill to actually get obsolete i'm just fictitiously speaking not necessarily everything will become like that the question then still remains is how do you pick up faster how do you unlearn and pick up the new things faster and equally is for the leadership inside the organizations and when it say leadership it's for every employee within the organization across sectors is the changes are happening much more rapidly and how do we become open to those changes use it by connecting the dots to saying what technology see technology by itself is never a end solution a generative ai is not a end solution some of the time they say prompting is much more important than having a tool of generative ai what do you ask as a question to google or to chat gpt is more important than what is there in google so a lot of time the information is available more important is what question are you asking to get the right answer earlier it was who is giving the right answer maybe it will shift to saying who is asking the right question because the answer will automatically come out the same for everybody with the same prompt so what's more important is the skill is changing even in our own minds to say maybe the last answer of the maths is not important but asking the right question of saying what do we need to do to achieve certain thing is more important actually in that ways and equally when we look at the learning within the organizations the learning within the organizations had to get tuned to becoming hyper personalized but equally highly democratized from a availability of those tools perspective which will help people to change and the experiences in terms of the projects or on the job learnings and those will actually start differentiating the employees as well as the good organizations from the earlier organizations which will then maybe become dinosaur in a certain way what anand touched upon in us so thanks anand uh, thank uh, jerry just taking from what uh, vikram said um do you have any uh, probably uh, use case or you heard about where these technology uh, the, the the new technology is being used in the uh, hr functions and how it has helped organizations and uh, the future leaders to take good uh, decisions yeah so um so i'd like to clarify that hr is not very different uh, compared to the uh, you know larger adoption of technology by the business yeah because uh, hr is a part and parcel of the business which has adopted technology uh, but specifically the use cases of uh, where you know the the entire uh, life cycle of an employee across all these chain of activities H hr has deployed technology in a very very big way and uh, when i talk about technology it is basically also about 
you know, data, how do we leverage data in order to take people decisions much better. It is about what are some of the tools that we employ in order to reach to uh, our internal customers, or which is the employees far more better than what we were doing. In a scaled up organization, it is difficult for you to reach out to every single employee. How can you basically deploy technology in order to basically reach out to every employee, understand what they feel. So there's a lot of technology which is now evolving, which touches upon every aspect of the HR systems and processes, which helps HR to become far more effective in terms of being faster to uh, employ responses, providing them services, taking decisions relating to uh, some of the people-related issues. You know, So let me give you some examples uh, since uh, so, for example, attrition, you know, retention is a very big issue, uh, you know, within companies in terms of how we do it. Today, technology helps us to basically crunch a large amount of data that we have in attrition to basically make predictions about who are, what is the cohort of people who are more likely to quit in the, within your organization. What are some of the drivers of retention which will work if you intervene early from that data? So a lot of anal data analytic tools have come up in order to help get uh, help HR, man, HR fraternity get a lot of insights about what are some of the decision points that they need to act upon in order to you know, address some of the issues that HR is managing, which is either in terms of attrition. Take the case of engagement. You know, uh, there are bots today which basically go reach out to every single employee, understand what they are feeling at that point in time, so that you can basically then take timely preventive action or intervention in order to Today, there is a lot of technology which uh, basically we use in learning, which helps curate whatever is relevant information for people from across the entire ecosystem, whether it is knowledge which is based in YouTube, whether it is research papers, whether it is. So it does a lot of intelligent curation of the requirement and needs of the individual and presents it in, to the individual so that his learning is far more effective rather than him having to basically search the universe in terms of what he needs to do. The, in terms of recruitment, a whole host of technologies which have come in, which is basically helping to pass candidates, you know, looking at what, some of the effective competencies that you need in people in order to, for them to be effective at the work. So there's a lot of technology which has also come in the recruitment space to basically help take better decisions in terms of how you select your talent. I can go on and on, but you know, there's a huge, some of the technologies which I mentioned is something that we if, currently use within the organization, and the businesses have seen the impact of these, uh, you know, interventions. So these and many are, uh, you know, some of the technological, you know, adoptions that HR has done, build the workforce in order to basically also, you know, adopt some of these technologies. And we have seen the results of that on some of the key HR metrics like engagement or attrition for that matter. Thanks, uh, Jerry. Uh, so I have a very uh, typical question from an HR angle. And all these students sitting here I think I can ask one question on their behalf. Each of these students have got some expectations from, from the employment which they first take. And we would have seen in our own careers where we have been dealing with uh, management trainees that these expectations have moved over a period of time. They have completely changed what it was say 10 years back, five years back, and uh, what it is today. Uh, what do you think is the expectation these guys have from organizations and when they enter the workforce, and how do you think uh, organizations would like us, and why I say like us, because most of these organizations that we are sitting here today are uh, traditional organizations for long, they have you know, certain things which they have to go, certain change may be a little different in that, including the mindset and the cultures which are there. For example, today, students may like to I would not say the word argue, but discuss a point of difference between them and the boss. Is it accepted? Is it done? Is it not done? How does it look like? And what is the expectation probably you have seen as an HR person from the uh, uh, generation Y, Z, whatever you may call them? So thank you, Anand. And I'm sure the students are happy because you're asking something you know, on their behalf. So. Um, Inherently, I think human beings need to be, they want to be heard, um, understood, and given a platform to express. And I don't think it's much different when we become professionals and we join an organization. So um, as an organization, I think it's important to create an environment where every individual as a professional is able to express without fear. 
whether it's opinion, views, counter arguments. Not so much about, no, not, not getting restricted by hierarchy, but feeling respected as an individual. And today, if you look at even the societal fulcrum is quite different. Like, you know, there is a, um, there, there's a certain change where people have far, far more acknowledgement of who they are as people. And obviously, that's what comes to the organization. Like in HDFC Yoga, we, we invite people to bring their whole self to work. What essentially it means is if one day I am not 100%, my organization is there to hold space and say, you can come and tell your manager that or your colleague, I mean, I have done it so many times with my team members saying, don't expect any big decisions from me today because I'm not my 100%. And I expect that my team is also equally um, transparent and equally comfortable to come and say that. That don't, you know, let, let, let today not be my best day because I'm not feeling my best. And I think this is a, the basic way to reciprocate respect to an individual. And who walks into the organization is, is a human being, is an individual. It's not HR professional or a business leader or a salesperson. Inherently, everyone needs the same thing. And it's important then for the organizations to understand that, and especially HR, to understand that we're dealing with human beings here. You're talking about uh, AI. I think it's a beautiful combination of real intelligence, human intelligence, plus artificial intelligence. And I'll give you an example. Every day at about 9 o'clock in HDFC Yogo, there is a, there's a nudge which, talks, which goes to everyone's uh, mobile to ask, how are you feeling today? Just the fact, very fact that when I'm walking into office and there is something which asks me, how am I feeling today? Uh, I think as an individual, it, it does something to me. And there's a moodometer. And then the moodometer obviously is studied at you know, different intervals. But what it does is that maybe at that that at that particular day since morning, nobody has asked me how am I feeling. But my organization has made something possible through technology, where as I enter work and you know, at, at a particular time, it asks me how am I feeling. And I'm prompted to take an action, to say I'm feeling great today, I'm not feeling great today, I'm feeling sad today. I mean, there are, there, there are actually real emotions there. I think that's what people genuinely want from an organization, simply. Am I welcomed in the organization? Do I have the platform to express what I feel? Am I heard, seen, and understood? I mean, that's how basic I, f I think the organizations need to do. Great. So, uh, if I can just quickly just add on to that. Yeah, uh, I, just, I, was, I was actually coming to you. Along with this, I also want you to tell me, because when I interact with these students, majority of them say we want to get into general insurance, not, not life insurance. And I see very few people saying I want to get into reinsurance. I'll change that thought <laughs> okay. at the same time. So I, was, I want to come to tell you with this, what is it that you have and what is your ex the thing about the expectations from this uh, yeah. crowd? So, so I think uh, just on a li completely lighter side, I know that about 10, 15 years back, um, all of us sitting on very similar panels were having a conversation about how to manage the millennials, right? Now the millennials are the managers and they're just as clueless about how to manage you, okay? <laughs> Uh, so now we feel for the millennials, and I think the generational gap and, and the way that people react to different things is wider than it ever was before. Um, and even the time span that generational changes are happening is also reducing. So it's getting wider and shorter at the same time, right? Um, and um, if I have to again just go back to, uh, might I assume, our generation, I'm not assuming age at all over here on the panel, but I think in our times, to a certain extent, when we were told to jump, we said, how high, not why, <laughs> right? However, I think if there is one underlining factor that I see as a change, uh, uh, in addition to the human factor, um, it's that I think with the newer generation, that engagement of why is very important. You're giving me a task, okay, tell me why. This is the company's strategy, okay, why? Why are we chasing this objective? And I think as long as, long as organizations can do that with this, to this new generation, uh, generation AI, I think, um, I think a large part of that does get addressed to a certain extent. Uh, coming to the second part of your question, I think reinsurance generally has been uh, a very, very small uh, 
environment, so to speak. I can't even call it an industry uh, as such. We are part of the wider insurance industry. Um, and uh, I think between Swiss Re, Munich Re, and Hanover Re, we probably control 80% of the global business any which way. So there are essentially four or five companies globally that you can go and work for. And because it's hardcore B2B business, uh, if I look at Swiss Re's India footprint, which is a front end uh, business, that's only 60 people. That's it. So it's not a place where you can typically, or you'll typically look at from a long term career perspective in the times gone by. What is changing, however? What's changing is uh, in the last decade or decade plus, um, the global, India is more and more looked at as being the global hub of insurance industry. It's not just the Indian in, uh, insurance industry or insurance industry. So today, uh, an organization like Swiss Re, we employ more than two and a half thousand people across Bangalore and Hyderabad uh, doing work for Swiss Re globally. Today, um, if I am to just step away from Swiss Re for a moment, today the highest number of actuarial students and people following that career path are not employed by an insurance company. It's EY. So even the way that you uh, that we have traditionally looked at uh, the industry is also changing in the in a more global context. Coming back to Swiss Re, today uh, almost the entire globe's NatCat modeling is happening out of Bangalore. Right? Today uh, all of Swiss Re's IFRS related changes are happening out of Bangalore. Um, if I just continue on the IFRS topic, then the entire RFRS ch IFRS change for the global insurance companies is, by the way, being driven out of India. That contract may be again with EY or a PwC or whoever in New York, but the people who are actually implementing that change are sitting in India, between Gurgaon and Bangalore and Chennai and, and whatnot, and, and Mumbai, of course. So I think. Um, whether it's reinsurance as an industry uh, or it's the global insurance reinsurance footprint, I think that's changing dramatically. I think this, the entire population sitting here is at a unique cusp. Uh, go grab it, in, in my view. Especially, just look out for the jobs that we have. Come work for us. We're an awesome place to be. Great. That's uh, absolutely, I think, encouraging. Um, Jerry, one, um, I think that we have another uh, two, three minutes left before we open up this. So one question which I, you know, which uh, hit my mind is uh, earlier, you know, people used to join a particular vertical or a particular discipline in insurance and probably go with that. For example, even if you look at actuarials, a guy would always be in an actuarial department or a claims guy would be in the claims department, underwriter would be in the underwriter department. But off late this, you have, we have seen a huge amount of, um, you know, changes that are happening in these kind of roles which are there. Though they might be doing more of actuarial uh, work, but it might not be the actual department. They will be probably looking at data scientists, or maybe something like that. How do you think the HR is in a position to um, cope up with these uh, changes from the core competency of that person to a completely different, though it's an allied part of thing, and still make that person uh, more productive and more interested in the organization. Do you, do you have uh, some clarity on that? Yeah, so um, I think so the way that organizations are evolving over a period of time, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the entire way in which organizations are getting, uh, re are reorganizing themselves, the way in which they are morphing their structures in order to meet the demands of the external market that itself basically provides the opportunity for students who are coming in. Just to give you an example, for a, you know, if you look at the way in which traditional structures within insurance are, you know, changing, and I talk about the foreign companies, the you know, the companies in the developed markets, the companies in the developed markets have already moved to being traditional insurance companies to insure tech companies. Yeah, and if you want to be an insure tech company, you need to basically make sure that you are working in cross-functional teams you are basically taking decisions which is basically not, uh, you know, where you are able to give decisions very quickly rather than go through the hierarchy. So what it means is that organization structures will keep evolving. 
it will give far more importance to cross-functional teams, which are basically working together in order to deliver. And for working in such cross-functional teams, you need the skill sets, which are far more complementary rather than specialist. So in a, in a cross-functional team, for example, you know, let me give you a simple case of a product organization. You All of you know what a product organization is, where the customer is at the center of uh, what you do. You deploy technology in a very big way in order to meet these requirements. And you take decisions at a lower level. You don't escalate it to the management in order to get your decisions. Such you know, cross-functional teams, they rely heavily on, on, on skill sets which are easily fungible and, and work across. So for example, if you are a underwriter in such a cross-functional team, you are expected to basically deploy data analytics to very large extent in order to basically find out what really the, whether the consumer needs or the risk profile that you've identified is aligned to whatever the business model is or no. Or for example, if you are working in business, your own understanding of the customer has to be basically layered by a lot of understanding of the data on the customer that you already have in order to see what profitable segment you can get into, cannot get into. So I'm saying that today, organizations as they basically become far more fluid in terms of how they are organized in terms of meeting the needs of the market, the expectation in terms of skill sets have, have become far more you know, varied. It has to be multidisciplinary for you to basically contribute to the best of your ability. And therefore, I think so that's, that's a change that is you know, gradually evolving as far as the industry's organization is concerned. Um, you know, the other important thing is that um, you know, leadership obviously is a, is a function of uh, you know, perspectives that people build, right? It is about different points of view, uh, your ability to see different you know, issues from different angles and form a point of view. And that obviously can't happen if you are just sitting in a particular function and specializing in it. Yeah, you need to move across, you need to improve the breadth of your experience in terms of basically getting exposure in different functions, different businesses, different geographies, because that's really what will enrich your experience in terms of understanding and building your perspective and point of view. And if you don't do that, obviously you stand as a disadvantage. So even though there are a lot of companies which have not really moved to the insurtech space, they have ensured that they basically give exposure to people in terms of varied experiences across geographies, across businesses, across different skill sets, so that you are basically readying the talent to take on those challenges in future. And that's really some of the two big developments that are happening within the industry in terms of how the, the, the talent set is being prepared to be far more you know, agile and flexible when it comes to basically business opportunities. Thanks. Uh, just before I open it, uh, Vikram, just a small uh, thing before we close. The only thing what we always say, the only thing that is constant is change. Nothing else is constant, okay? So how do you think uh, leaders can be drivers of this change in today's scenario? Oh, very short uh, from all of you before we open this up to the uh, uh, audience. On a lighter note, few days back I listened to somebody, he said change and taxes are the two things which are constant ones. <laughs> And I think so the government building upon more on that in every country across the globe. Uh, see, change as a topic uh, is a very big topic. And while we actually try to very quickly within a minute or so actually solve about it, see, leaders as change agents can only happen when leaders themselves also want to change equally on the other things. And then they become torch bearers for obviously the change. Uh, to just be having that prophecy of saying that I am telling you this is to get change, the question on the other side of the table automatically happens, who are you to tell us a lot of times, actually, which is there. While that comes with the authority of the chair, the change doesn't get embedded. And then it takes ages for the policies and the governance to take place. So automatically, the leaders itself, when they are into the habit of obviously saying what they can do better for themselves to become and take on varied experiences and larger roles, is the time they become better torchbearers of change. And therefore, every organization wants to treat that way uh, in terms of helping people at every level to be better than what they are today. And in this whole process, they automatically became, become the change agents, whether they want it intentionally or even unintentionally, uh, is when then automatically the revolution actually starts in a certain way of change, which is there. Thanks, Vikram. Your, your thoughts on this? Uh, 
So Anand, I feel that uh, as a leader, it's important to unpack that change. So what does that change really mean? Is it a simple tweak? Is it a 180 degree shift? Is it a change in policies? So to unpack that change and then demonstrate through behavior uh, to basically manifest the change in, the, in a day's work. Yeah, I think that's what it is. No, I think uh, <coughs> I, I completely resonate. I think change is the only thing that is constant. So uh, I think as long as organizations continue to adapt and people continue to have that learning mindset, I think they should be perfectly placed to face anything that comes their way. So nothing too different from what my panelists have already spoken. Jerry, your views? So I think so one of the biggest learnings from all major change that has happened across the globe, whether it's in corporate or others, is that uh, you know one of the biggest derailers uh, of change is when you know people have not bought it in. You know, they are not aligned to what is happening. And I think so that's the biggest challenge that every leader has. You know, they'll be able to change great uh, you know, policies, systems, processes, change the entire thing. But if, but if people are not convinced, they don't get aligned to what, they don't believe the larger vision that the leader has in order to you know, build the impact, obviously the change will fall flat. So carrying people along, you know, energizing, you know, getting them to believe in this larger vision that the leader is trying to bring in is one of the critical uh, you know, levers for success for any change program. And, and if, we are, if you know, people are, peop we have seen the examples of so many people who have effectively done that. And uh, failure to do that is a guarantee for, uh, or a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and uh, therefore it puts a lot of uh, responsibility on leaders. And I'm not talking about HR alone. It is about uh, leaders across functions, across the business, who play a very important role in mobilizing people. Yeah, basically getting them to believe in this and then basically adopt this change gradually. You know, th it won't, it's not a, you know, easy journey. It's, that's the most difficult part of any change. You know, putting a system or a process into place is the simplest thing. Yeah, it is like, uh, you know, you probably, it's a function of time, you quickly do it. But, you know, making a person aligned to believe in it and basically follow your, uh, you know, your vision is the most challenging task that all leaders have. And if that is done, I believe, uh, you know, the path is far more easier for change. I think that aspect of, um, you know, I completely resonate. The ADCAR methodology of change management, yeah. the f I think the first two alphabets, awareness for the need for change and the desire to want to change. I think if those two things are there, and that's the most difficult. Absolutely. I think the knowledge and all that will then eventually come, reinforcement will happen. Yeah. But I think awareness and desire to change is absolutely crucial. Great. Thanks. Uh, I think, uh, friends, we have taken uh, the allotted time and we have looked at this uh, thing of crafting workplaces for the future. We looked at uh, starting from what was it when probably we started working, what was the uh, works, workplace so-called and what it is today and what the journey completely uh, requires us from the HR side and probably some of the questions that you might have in the mind. So I now uh, maybe open it for questions, one or two questions, if we have time. Yes, yeah. So any of these students, anyone who's present here would like to ask, only tell me the name of the panelist you want to do, or is it a general question for any, any one of us to take? That will be uh, more... Uh, yes. <coughs> Ma'am, just a minute. I, I think those, uh, one of the students have... Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Akhil Gandhi. I'm a first year PGDM student. Uh, my, uh, it is a general question. Uh, as insurance industry involves building long-term client relationships, how can we as management students develop re uh, leadership qualities that prioritize relationship building and trust? A great question. Um, so uh, general in insurance industry has both short-term and long-term relationship with consumers. So uh, on the health insurance side, which is large, largely a long-term relationship, as a leader, it's important to acknowledge that um, investing in health is not a short-term decision. Investing in health means that the organization holds space for that consumer as the consumer makes that decision to invest in a health insurance. 
and try and ensure that every year, as, a, as the provider of that insurance, the company is making sure that the person takes the accountability and ownership of maintaining good health. This is more for the consumer rather than for the company. But, but I think that's the relationship as a leader, the, the, as a leader, that's the kind of relationship that um, one would want to build with a consumer from a long term. And then support with products which suits the person's needs as the person keeps changing from one life stage to the other, from one age to the other. That's how one builds a long-term relationship with a client. And about trust, it's standing up and making sure that the moment of truth is delivered when it, is, when it requires to be delivered. Whether it is through changing the, the products to suit the person's needs, whether it's paying claims on time, whether it is servicing the consumer the way the consumer wants to be serviced, at a particular age, one may want to be serviced in a certain way. And as one progresses, as one's buying capacity increases, the demand for service also, in, also goes through a change. And as an agile leader, it will be important to create those positive moments of truth as the relationship matures. Anybody wants to add? Just to add what Roshina said, I'll, I'll wear my marketing and sales hat on this. Uh, especially, I will bifurcate this into life insurance and general insurance because I have uh, I've had the experience of handling life and now general. Life insurance, you know, is a long-term contract, okay? General insurance is a one-year contract. Normal grouse of a customer with a, with a insurer, whether life or general, is you connect with me only at the time of renewal. Otherwise, you don't even bother to look at me. That's a big, big, big grouse people had, okay? That's where I think for the last so many years, especially after the pandemic and the digital uh, revolution has gone up, every organization is coming up with or, or is having apps with whom they can interact with the customer. Okay? Those things are not just for interaction, it's also to help the customer understand their needs. In India, the biggest problem is all of us need insurance, but at the same time we feel we don't need insurance. Okay. Secondly, we want insurance, we should take insurance when we don't need it, but normally we go to buy insurance when we can't take it. Okay, to give you an example, I am a perfectly healthy man, I mean, why should I have a health insurance, why should I have a term plan, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow if I have a heart attack or a thing, then I start scouting for insurance policies. At that point of time, nobody is ready to give me. The same agent who was running after me doesn't even pick up my call. So as an as a, as a organization, you have to be very clear of how do you maintain the customer, how do you engage with the customer on a regular basis, not just at the time of renewal, and also see how you can meet their requirements. Because you have the data when the customer comes in. If you can use analytics, if, if you can do things, which is the next best product we can offer to this customer based on the data which I have. I think that again helps. So the, the customer also feels that the com company is you know, concerned about me and is probably looking at doing so. There are many things that you can work out on the life side, on the non-life side, on the health side to keep this relationship with the customer going. And as Zorakshana said, in insurance, when we, when we take the premium, what do we give the customer? A piece of paper. The, the biggest moment of truth is when the claim comes in. How do you manage the claim? How easily you ensure that the person gets the uh, thing what is required for without any hassles of something, so many documents, and then saying, no, we can't pay you the claim. So servicing plays a big, big, big role in this part. And now, with, especially with digitization, I think there are a lot many companies or other, all of them who are putting a lot of effort on uh, customer engagement and uh, servicing of that. Have we answered your question? Yeah. Ma'am, you had a question? Yes. Uh, <coughs> a very simple question, and uh, that's just because I come from a different background. I just want to understand that the talent pool here for the No, no, the, the okay. students might not. Huh. So, uh, the talent pool is actually for the insurance uh, community per se. My, if you minus the NIA, BIMTECs, NLUs, and all these colleges, 
how do you where do you guys find the talent from uh, when you have to hire because every year that uh, i sit uh, with the hrs when they uh, sit for their planning of the budgets they are like we are looking at hiring 500 people <laughs> <laughs> while uh, the insurance industry is only giving us 100 people or if that's on the higher side also. Where do you guys find talent from? And that's a concern that I'm also, uh, I, I would really, really need some help on because you've got three best insurers and one top reinsurer sitting here. So it'll really help me to answer that question, please. Your, your, your question was really simple. But I don't know whether they will have a simple answer for it. I hope so. <laughs> so I cannot. hope so. I hope so they can answer. I'll try. <laughs> See, the whole concept of obviously saying talent and we discussed earlier, so born or shaped and all that. Um, See, obviously, certain places you need domain-specific talent, even within general insurance. And then there are certain functions where you can look at a much larger space where people have the right aptitude and with the basic right pedigrees to obviously with a higher probability of succeeding. You spread across India in certain ways uh, for getting that uh, talent in certain way. And therefore, those other than the pure insurance colleges, some of the times other colleges also have insurance as electives which are there. And some of the times, uh, as organizations like we, uh, we have gone into certain colleges with uh, tie-ups on building that electives and where we partner in terms of even building the skill of insurance. And that too specific on a general insurance side. And then once people who have that appreciation more towards the insurance side of it, and they also clear the minimum basics, is we try to get them into the same space of obviously into employment in that way. See, India has a happy problem of more jobs than in insurance some of the times than purely insurance students. However, is every insurance student ready to take on every kind of job within insurance? is a question which even the group has to answer. So there is always a dearth for the right people for the right job. Uh, even with the number of institute in increasing, it's also about the aspiration of people matching into what the job role offers. And therefore, some of the time, there are other people who raise their hands, take on that, become big very, very fast. And that's how we, all of us as an industry, we try to get those people alongside in terms of becoming a part of uh, the insurance in that way. And uh, uh, while reinsurance, Priyadarshi will touch upon, I am touching on more from a general insurance perspective. So, Dikshna, Jerry, Priyadarshi, whomsoever may want to add. So, to add to Vikram, I think it's a call to action for the industry now to really expand the pie. And I say this responsibly, having worked in mobile telecom when it was launched. And, I, and that, that's, some, that's one learning that I had personally as well, that that industry was built without in, any mobile telecom professionals. And that industry grew and became one of the most coveted industries. How did that happen? So there is a user used case available. And I think we've discussed this a couple of times, between Jerry and Vikram, that it's time for us to really expand the pie. And, I, and I also say this from a practitioner's perspective, that we, we took this decision of expanding our talent pool a couple of years ago. And we looked at inviting people from other than insurance industry to join us, even in uh, you know, roles like sales. And today, I mean, at HGFC, I think we are upwards of 20% uh, of our talent, which is not from the insurance industry. And we can only grow from here. So sometimes it's important to just see that what, how can I contribute back to the industry by bringing in more talent uh, within the industry and increase the pie. So yeah, that's the approach that we are taking. And also, it's, it's also our humble step towards acknowledging diversity. So it's not just staying true to only insurance experts can build the industry. Of course they can, and they are, and they have been. Uh, but perhaps it's also time for us to look at other industries and invite them to see what outsiders in perspective as to how, what they can add to the insurance industry. So yeah, that's the approach that we are taking. Yeah, so, um, so traditionally, if you look at ICICI, we would, uh, you know, look at, I, I don't want to equate uh, horses with people, but it is horses for courses approach, yeah, which is saying that, you know, relevant talent, which are specialists who understand this industry, obviously, we'll go and pick up from, uh, you know, students who understand this industry, who basically brought in. 
but but the larger uh, you know in inflow of jobs or the requirement of jobs in an organization is primarily at the front end yeah at at the sales level and there the kind of skills you need are not specifically understanding the industry very well it is you can use a lot of the complementary skills that you need for selling you know understanding distributors you know how to basically sell that you that skill is easily available in the market i'm not only talking about students i'm talking about people who are working in telecom people who are working in fast moving consumer goods industry so these are complementary skills which you can actually use in insurance as well and therefore the approach is there you know widen the talent pool by looking at a much bigger you know group of people who can stabilize your supply yeah so that you don't face challenges with them when you go forward so that's been the approach uh, build you know obviously knowledge uh, you know it's it's a general insurance business is slightly more complicated than you know the other lines of business you'll take some time for onboarding people but if they have the basic skills and competencies to do it yeah to understand this industry very quickly then it's it's basically then the execution and the application which becomes far more important and therefore that's the belief so so make a mix in such a way that you have access to a wider talent pool where you can get the best from everything yeah so that's really the approach in terms of how icc lombard has gone about it and it's worked for us you know so a lot of the industry professionals who have come in are people who have never had any background in insurance you know they are people who basically learned it the hard way they understood this and then they integrated themselves yeah that is not to be little uh, you know or or say something different about people who have specialized in insurance their worth is is really needed in some of the specialist functions you know underwriting actuarial you know you know obviously because the training allows them to basically do this far more effectively but the biggest jobs are not there the biggest jobs are in the front line yeah for which we need you know resources which are basically aligned to what the requirement is i lad on so there is a positive you know silver lining to the cloud when you see other people coming to this industry means automatically the industry is well poised for each one of you over a period of time to grow very fast and you are actually joining <laughs> joining the right place in the insurance from that perspective because see what sudikshna said telecom they took up people from fmcgs they took up people from beverages in a cousins they took up people uh, from the alcohol liquor industry which were again cousins of fmcgs because telecom was offering something more and people joined when you hear about the stories and uh, you are hear about actually maybe most of us we came to insurance from a different industry equally we are talking about a lot of other people joining the industry and jerry also pushed on it so dikshna told about it which means the industry is very well positioned and truly the sunrise is starting to happen now while the industry would had been in place for a longer time which is it so it's uh, i personally see it as a good opportunity for anybody who enters this industry irrespective of the brand is to build a good career from a perspective and the guy who first asked the question what is required from a management associate some of the times is just to be in the right place uh, and just keep yourself invested in i think so it's a good time for the industry to get yourself in and keep yourself invested in that's it thanks i think for us in a pre insurance world for swiss re on the build side um, it, there is a bit of a scarcity given the slightly more complex jobs that we typically have uh, we don't have sales and hence that's not uh, that's not something that we can typically hire and hence we we have a program called unilink where we are consciously trying to tie up with um, uh, industry and academia uh, partnerships so we've tied up with industry of risk management you may have seen a news article very recently where we've tied up with the institute of actuaries where we are trying to build about and swissri is giving them the knowledge and they are in turn sharing their experiences with us and hopefully we're looking at something very similar with nia where hopefully we are able to build that awareness for firstly choosing insurance as a as a career industry and hopefully just opening the gates a, a bit wider on the buy side it's very easy for us i hire from icici so it's uh, most of the ceos today i'm yeah so if i have to buy i go to the people who have the talent at this point of time and if you especially if you are looking at more senior people uh, in the global industry right now uh, the global insurance reinsurance industry in india uh, that type of talent is not available because it's relatively nascent so we do not have any other choice but to go to the domestic insurance industry where 
sometimes we come across as cooler and it's, easy, it's easier to convince people to come and join us. Any other question or uh, should we? No. Yeah. I think we have already exceeded the time. So last question. Hello yeah. everyone. So my question is to uh, Pierarshi sir. Sir, as you cited in the military example that it's about uh, 35 pairs of eyes focused on a leader. So uh, even leader uh, is a person and sometimes uh, it does happen that you assess a situation wrong or uh, in a critical situation your uh, decision doesn't go that way. So how difficult it gets or how feasible it is for a leader to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to, be, to, to take responsible for it or to have that accountability and get along in a much more positive way along with the team so that uh, morale doesn't go down or, you know, to maintain uh, the balance, uh, the leader and the employee balance. I'll, I'll try and be uh, as brief as I can on this one. Uh, I think uh, uh, there was a Harvard uh, research study that was done which involved more than 100 organizations uh, across the group. Uh, Armed Forces wasn't one of them, but nonetheless, uh, the trait that came out as being the most important that people seek in a leader is self-awareness. None of the other fancy words that you'll typically hear. Self-awareness. Does a leader understand who he or she is? What they bring to the table? And hence, at times, just being just having that viewpoint and um, being open to hearing from the people that you lead is extremely important. It is not possible for a leader to have all the answers. It is not humanly possible. So just because you're a leader, do not assume that you know more than the people that you lead. Right? And as long as you can do that right, as long as you seek responses from them, involve them in the decision making, then it just becomes that much easier. If I have to give you my personal example, um, I joined the army just immediately after, I got commissioned immediately after Kargil. So I wasn't part of all the fun that happened. Um, however, a few years later, I had to command troops from 17 Jat. Have you heard of 17 Jat? Yeah, so I had to command troops from 17 Jat. I was a 22-year-old cocky individual who thought he knows everything. And now I have to teach mountain warfare to people who have actually fought in the mountains. You think I know better than that guy? It's not possible. So have self-awareness and just understand that there are people that you lead who probably know more than you. And that, by the way, is very true for management students. Just like I went to an academy and I thought, yeah, I, I know everything. That's not the case. You, a lot of you are going to lead sales teams who have got 15 years, 10, 15 years of experience. And they're going to look at you for answers. You've got maybe some experience before you came to NI or maybe none. Involve them in the decision making. Have self-awareness of what you know and what you don't know. That's the only advice I'd give. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Just Sorry. saying, can I add to this one actually, couldn't stop actually, because a very important point on self-awareness. Also, another thing is, in the long run, with your friends, with your parents, or anybody, wherever you are involved in a longer relationship, not maybe many years, but at least for a substantial time in terms of months or something, you don't evaluate the person on the other side is by the quality of decision which is right or wrong. You evaluate the people is by the quality of intentions. With what intentions do they work and they do? Because you, when you're in the thick and thin alongside, and you can answer that question, each one of us for ourselves, wherever we are involved in those teams, truly not groups, and we have been together, we give the credit to the people on the intentions, not on the decisions. And a lot of times when you, all your decisions may not go right also. Because not even a computer can take all decisions right because there are multiple variables, thousands of them at the same time, inversely proportional a lot of times. Therefore, what is more important some of the times is your self-awareness is there and your intention is correct. If your intention is correct, a lot of it is also taken in the same stride as what the positive decision would have done in a certain way. Uh, I just wanted to add that bit of it. Thank you. Just, um, you know, 
I just wanted to touch upon this uh, self-awareness aspect. You know, it's, there's a very interesting analogy I've heard. And I want to share it with you because uh, that will make it very much alive in terms of what we're trying to communicate. So if you look at the game of tennis, yeah, uh, you know, how effective a player is obviously depends upon the way he plays his smashes. You know, he basically has his own stamina at the, on the field, the techniques he uses in order to basically, you know, score a point. All that is what he does externally. It is his skills, his competencies in terms of how he can become a better player to score points. And while that is important, you know, without great skill, competency, you cannot become a great player. Another important thing which is happening is in the mind of the player. Yeah, what is happening inside his head. That is a very important part. Yeah, that is basically his own inner operating system, which basically gives him the confidence that he should basically continue his, his own passion for the game, whether he has to give up at an early stage or no, what are his values in terms of his integrity, in terms of, you know, uh, playing with that person. What, you know, will he give up too early when he sees, you know, his chances of victory are low. All this is basically an internal mental game. What Vikram was talking about intention or what uh, Priyadarshi was talking about self-awareness. That is finally what will basically make or break you. You can easily attain skills, competencies, you know, whatever is required to become a very effective manager or leader. But if your internal operating system, which is about your own values, beliefs, your own awareness about yourself is not good, it will become a derailer for you. It, you can't play the long run. You, can, you, know, you can't go, when you get into complex problems, complex issues, you know, the, this internal operating system of yours will hold you back. It will never, basi it will basically derail you and not allow you to become a great leader and effective. So if you see all leaders, they basically play the outer game, which is the skills and competencies game, plus also look at their value systems, their integrity, what's happening in their mind, their mindset, their, their awareness is at a very, very elevated level. Yeah, that is why they are able to basically break the mental shackles. If there is a challenging problem, they basically then break up the mental shackles in order to basically go and, you know, uh, you know, face that problem. They may not have the answers to everything, but it is that attitude which basically makes them go and deliver it. So that's something is, what I, this is a very brilliant illustration of what I learned from someone else in terms of how you can build this analogy in the world of sports and build that to, you know, into the operating environment in which all of us are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists, for such interesting insights. Now I request my colleagues to kindly come forward and present mementos to the speakers as a token of gratitude. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. With this, we come towards the end of first panel discussion.